Hello, everyone, and welcome to Fertile Ground with Mike and Coach. My name is Mike Cornell, and I'm alongside Coach Ron Lathy. Have you ever wondered when Christ will return to earth? And or have you ever wondered how Christ is going to return to earth? And Coach, I think the answers to those questions might be a little different than what most people expect. Could be. And as we get started here today, we have three things we would like for you to think about and to consider And the first one is this. What events need to take place between the tribulation and the millennial reign of Christ? And this is a really good spot if you're a note taker. Grab a pen, grab a piece of paper, grab your Bible, and follow right along with us here today. Second of all, what is the significance of Jesus entering the Holy of Holies for the first time? And then finally, how do the Jewish fall feasts relate to the end time events. And today, Coach, we we continue with this journey that we started on several months ago now and uh, through the book of Revelation. And and it's been exciting. It's getting even more exciting. And we're about to enter into a a climatic time here in the book of Revelation. And here we see, we're in segment 14 this week, we see Christ's victorious return. And here we go. Last week was the Armageddon campaign that we studied, and it really set the stage for this, what we're going to study today, what's called Christ's victorious return. And Coach, could you get us started with some prayer and just kind of set the stage for us here today? Sure. Let us pray. Most kind and loving Heavenly Father, again, Lord, we humbly come before you. First of all, just thanking you for the many blessings that you give us. We thank you, Lord, for allowing us to to do our our Sunday school situation through the book of Revelation. It's been a blessing to uh, to all of us that's been involved as your book promises. Uh, Lord, we just pray that people uh, have have learned and and have uh, uh, bought into knowing what their future holds. And Lord, we just are so thankful that you've allowed us to do this and many people we've been been able to reach. Lord, we pray for those that are hurting right now by whatever reasons it might be, uh, whether it be physical, uh, it might be spiritual, uh, emotional. Lord, you know each situation, and Lord, you are the great healer, and we would just put them in your hands. Now, Lord, as we open your word today, again, uh, we just pray that you would open our hearts and, and uh, just let the Holy Spirit lead us in the direction that we are to go. Uh, open the hearts of those that are listening right now. And just, uh, Lord, just let them uh, tune in to what the th- Spirit is saying. Now, Lord, as we open your book, we just go along with us, Lord, and just show us what you want us to say. These things we ask your son's precious and holy name. Amen. Amen. Okay, yeah, it has been uh, quite a journey. Yes, <laughs> quite a journey, and I'm sure a lot of people are wondering, when's this thing ever going to end? <laughs> but we are coming toward, to the end, and it's, it's a, a very blessed ending that we're going to find out if you are Christian. Right. And um, if not, then we would like for you to especially take note and, and listen to what's being said in these last few chapters. we got to, uh, you know, we're, we're about up to uh, almost to chapter 20 now. Uh, and, uh, of course, 22 is the last one. Right. So we're getting toward, we can see the finish line, as they say. Uh, but to recap from last uh, our last lesson, uh, we looked into the the campaign of Arm of, of uh, Armageddon. We called it, and all the things that were involved. and And just to recap, something I think is really important is the state of the Jewish people at this time. Uh, we talked about it's going to be such a uh, horrible uh, event for them, this tribulation, because as the Bible tells us in Ezekiel, two out of every three Jews are going to die. Yep. And the remaining ones, the one third that are left, what we found out was that when uh, before Christ came back, the armies of the world had gathered around Jerusalem and it actually attacked and destroyed a lot of the people in Jerusalem and had ravaged the, you know, the, the, the women, it said, and the, the people were starving. It was just a terrible place to be. 
Uh, they had actually destroyed part of the city. Uh, there was a great earthquake that divided the city. And a lot of the people had had fled away from Jerusalem as Christ had warned them to do. Right. And they were heading for cover in, uh, as we believe, probably Petra. Uh, and we looked at Petra. And, and the thing that, that happened was it, it it got to the point Christ still had not come back yet when these armies attacked. Uh, and the Jews realized they had no hope. There was nowhere else to go but to God. And, and that's what they did. They turned back to God and they, they realized that they had missed the boat on the Messiah when Jesus was here the first time. And so when their last hope, gasp, they repented and came back to Christ. And, and uh, that's when we see Jesus appear uh, in the clouds uh, with all the armies in, of heaven and, and the angels in heaven coming down back down to earth. And this time uh, we saw him come coming down on a white horse again. And that takes us clear back into chapter six of Revelation. Yep. We saw that white horse before, but of course the rider then was the Antichrist. Had a different rider. Now this is the real, real McCoy here. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the interesting thing too that people may not realize is the significance of him riding a white horse. Because uh, in those times when a general was riding a white stallion, the leader of an army, that was the symbol that, that he was coming for war. Yeah. He was coming for battle. And, uh, and if he was coming peaceably, the Bible shows that they would often ride in on a donkey mm -hmm. instead of a white horse. And you stop and think we know that Christ, when he came the first, in the first advent, he came riding the donkey into Jerusalem because he was coming peacefully. Yep. But this time he's coming back as he promised, and this time he's coming back on the white stallion, as the, and he's coming back prepared for battle. Yeah. So interestingly, that, that brings us to where we are right now, and that is the Battle of Armageddon. Of course, God, or, um, Christ simply spoke the word, and the battle was basically over. Right. And uh, all, the pe you know, all the people died, all the armies that, uh, that were gathered there. And the, we talked about that the blood was so high, the Bible said it would be as high as the, br the horse's bridle for a distance of, of the entire length of the, almost of Israel, which is about 175 miles. So it's just, uh, that's one of the, one of the goriest uh, chapters <laughs> in the Bible, uh, talking about the, the, the results of the Battle of Armageddon. But now we're ready to look and see where, what happens next. Yeah, and what happens after the tribulation right. really mm -hmm. is what we're yeah, right. taking a look at here. And that really, you know, we're beginning now, Coach, Christ's victorious return is what mm -hmm. the title of this segment is. And at the return of Christ, all things are going to be restored. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the exciting pieces of this, because that's what everything's been funneling down to since we started in the book of Revelation. And really, if you think about the entire Bible, mm -hmm. from Genesis 1-1 to right now, it's funneled to exactly this event yeah. that we're talking about here now. Yeah, and the exciting thing, Mike, is the fact that we're still a part of that. Yeah. It hasn't happened yet, but, but we, we can be a part of that. And there, there will no longer be any death. There will be no pain. There will be no crying. Uh, the, however, the return of Christ will not be a single event. No. It, it, it's a... It's a sudden event, but it will be preceded, preceded and followed by many other events. Mm -hmm. So the purpose of these events, Coach, is to prove the accuracy of God's judgments. Mm -hmm. If you watch how God's judgments are carried out exactly the way He said they would be mm -hmm. and the way He wants them to be, it's, it's miraculous. Right, right. And that takes us, uh, going back to Daniel chapter 12... Mm -hmm. And we're going to look at verses 11 and 12, and it's going to kind of set the stage for this victorious return right. that we're talking about here. And God's Word says this, From the time that the daily sacrifice is abolished and the abomination that causes desolation is set up, there will be 1,290 days. Blessed is the one who waits for and reaches the end of the 1,335 days. So, here we see some, some days that are important to us. 
Right, and they're not numbers we've been seeing. Right. Uh, these numbers, you know, the most obvious ones that we saw were ones like, you know, 42 months uh, or three and a half years or 1,260 days. Uh, those all three matched up to be the same length of time. But now we see one for 1,290 days and then another one for 1,335. So we need to kind of talk about what those numbers mean. And these are prophesied by Daniel. And basically what we need to realize is that between the time that the Armageddon battles over and the tribulation ends, right. There is a space in here between that and the beginning of the millennial kingdom. So that's kind of the space we're talking about because there's some things that need done uh, during this time period. And what we find out is that first number, 1290, that is 30 more days than the 1260 we've been dealing with. Right. And if we look and we find back in Daniel 2 that it says that what's going to happen there, it's kind of a cleansing of the temple that that's there because we know that the antichrist had desecrated the temple right. but i'm sure they had to remove that statue they had to go in and, and do many things to that and most scholars believe that's what that is for at least part of it and then from there a 1290 on to 1335 is another 40, 45 days making a total or uh, of uh, the days and that's a total of 75 right that we we want to take a look at. And so this is we're looking at that 75 day period between the end of the tribulation and the beginning of the millennial millennial reign. And what we're going to find out there's several things as I said that needs to be taken care of. For example, the Bible explains these to us. Uh, we don't know that exactly the time period as far as what's going to be in there, but we know these things have to be done sometime before the millennium. And one of those is the fact that uh, Jesus, as we said, is going to de going to destroy the temple, cleanse the temple, and then he's going to rebuild his temple the way he uh, wants it. The way he <laughs> wants it, you know, and that may happen during this time period. Uh, and we find out that that the temple was is mentioned in uh, the book of Ezekiel, and it takes two hundred and two verses to describe how that's going to be built <laughs> and what it's going to look like. So it's it's quite an extensive event there. Uh, the Messiah's temple will be the last temple built uh, on, the, on the Temple Mount. And so that's something that needs taken care of. There also needs to be a ju two judgments. One judgment is for the nations of the world. Right. The nations are going to be judged as their, you know, as their nations that are left. And then the uh, other is the actual judgment for the Jewish people that are still left alive there and uh, the part of the remnant. So they are going to be judged as well. And then there, there's also some resurrection, resurrected people that are going to be happening at that time, Daniel tells us. Old Testament saints are going to be, Daniel chapter 12 tells us, are going to be resurrected during this time, as well as all the saints that have been killed during the tribulation. They're going to be resurrected to their bodies. So all those are the events that have to take place sometime and this seems like a pretty good place to put it. So yeah. we don't know, you know, exactly, but we can take a wild, pretty good educated guess. And really, most of that really can't occur until the temple is rebuilt and ready because it's going to be the worship center right. for the entire world. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's going to be the center of everything right. at that time. And that, that takes us to that first question that we had, Coach, and what events need to take place between the tribulation and the millennial reign of Christ? Now, we talked about a 75-day period here, mm -hmm. and you've outlined some of that that's taken place. Anything else right. going on? Uh, that's one of the things, you know, perhaps, I don't know, but I would say that Jesus, since he said that the, the Christians are actually going to reign with him during this millennial time, uh, he, he's going to have to set up his government for for lack of a better better word to you know for tell people this is what you're going to be doing mm -hmm. you know th for a thousand years so that may take some time in, in there as well uh you know so we don't know for sure but we do know that those things have to come into play yeah okay all right let's move on to the next piece here and 
as this is all occurring, we see Jesus brings Jewish followers back to Jerusalem. Now, this is really important. Yes. It's really important because our, our, our understanding of Revelation is incomplete if we don't understand how Israel is involved. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people seem to forget that. God chose Israel to be his representatives here on earth. They are the people through uh, which he wanted to reveal himself to the world in the beginning anyways. Right. But God made several eternal promises to Israel, which makes it only natural to expect that Israel would play a key role in the end times. Mm -hmm. And Scripture reveals that they will. So if Scripture reveals that they will... I think we can take that part to the bank. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> and that takes us to Revelation 19, 13. And it says, And he was clothed with a, a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. So this robe dip that was dipped in blood is a symbol, really, of what was to about to take place. Right. And, and, what, and what has taken place and how he ties the, this together uh, this, of course, is Christ that's being talked about here. The, the his, that's Jesus Christ. It says his robe is basically, it looks like it's been dipped in blood, uh, at least spat, splattered with blood. And there's, again, you know, some confusion over where this blood comes from and what it represents. And, and I don't know that anyone knows 100%. Uh, those are one of, that's one of the things we still don't know from the Bible. But we can speculate. We can speculate. That's right, you know. And uh, what we do, it does tell us that uh, in, back in, in Ezekiel that uh, a pro, it's prophesied that the Messiah would get blood on his, on his coat or on his cloak that he has at the Battle of Armageddon. Right. And we do know that after the, uh, the battle at Jerusalem and Jesus comes back, he immediately kills the the enemies in around Jerusalem. Well, the ones that are left, they take off and, and leave, and they start heading down the Jezreel Valley to uh, to get all the, everybody together to take battle with Christ because they know he's going to come with them. So he's heading down that valley, and uh, when he gets there again, he simply speaks the word, and they all die, and that's where all of a sudden. You know, that just turns into a river of blood uh, that we, we've talked about. And many people, me included, believe that that blood, because uh, it talks about him walking it down the wine press of God. Yep. That wine press is always judgment. And as he is going down the valley, he's getting blood, I believe, from that river of blood from the battle. And, uh, and, you know, when the, they, they all were killed, I'm sure some would splash on him because he's right in the middle of everything, you know. So I think that's where the blood is coming from here. And we do know that there's some th speculation and also some prophecy that go along with this. One interesting one comes from Isaiah. And uh, we'll look at that here in a minute. But I think the blood here, I, you know, some people say, no, it's the blood from Calvary. Right. You know, others say, you know, say it's the blood of Armageddon. Uh, you know, we can't say for sure, but we know that the blood is representative of the sacrifice that Christ made to begin with. And now he's getting his vengeance in blood again. Yeah, I, I'm in your camp with that. You know, the, the, when he came the first time, the blood that was on his garment was his own blood. Right. Uh, but this was a totally different setting. And, right. and it really, even Isaiah alludes to it, I believe, yes. and talks directly about it. But the, the last part of that verse talks about the, his name was called the Word of God. Mm -hmm. And this can be explained by looking at one of John's other books, the Gospel of John. Yeah, right. I mean, it's right there. Yeah. It's the way it begins. That's right. In, in his Gospel, he called Jesus the Word of God made flesh. Mm -hmm. And it will be Jesus on the white horse that you talked about. And the judgment at Armageddon, which you've been talking about, mm -hmm. which will be the work of God. And, you know, he'll have these armies with him. Mm -hmm. But nobody's going to be, have to do a thing no. because Jesus is actually just going to speak it, and it's done. Right. The, 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 same, the same voice that spoke everything into existence uh, 
yep. is going to cause this or these armies to just die and totally uh, just in the you know just the snap of the fingers. Yeah. And and the word of God, you know that that's the thing people forget that just how powerful the word of God is, and the word of course is is the Bible itself. And when God, you know, Christ simply spoke everything into existence in the beginning in creation. And he can, for the same thing, uh, you know, the, the other thing is oftentimes when we think about Christ coming back, people that are not really Christians that don't really know this, what's going on, they, they say, oh, I don't believe that stuff, you know, because they don't understand how powerful God is. And, and he can, by simply the spoken word, uh, you know, cause supernatural things to happen. And that's what we see is happening here at the end of the end of the age, so to speak. But uh, but yeah, this this you know this word of God is is all it takes uh, to to accomplish this. Yeah, the the book of Revelation actually talks about it, and a sword came out of his mouth, mm -hmm. and that's a direct reference to the word of God because it's the most powerful thing there is, is actually his word. So. Right. And we'll take a look at Isaiah at chapter 63, and we're going to look at verses 1 and 2. It kind of gives us a little more information about this event that we're looking at. Right. And it says, Who is this who comes from Edom with crimson stained garments from Basra in Edom? This one who is glorious with his apparel, striding triumphantly in the greatness of his might. It is the one who speaks in righteousness, proclaiming vindication, mighty, to save. Verse 2 says, Why is your apparel splashed with red and your garments like the one who treads in the winepress? So the prophet asks why uh, the garment of the Lord is red, and now the Lord answers. Right. And and he also asks, says, this is a rhetorical question, both of them. Uh, he says, Who is this that comes from Edom? Uh, well, a lot of people don't realize, but Edom is exactly the area that was first of all it was it was settled first by the by Esau and it contains Basra and also it contains uh, Petra right in the mountains of Jordan that's the area that we're talking about here and so it says who is this that comes from Edom well as soon as the battle of Armageddon is over Jesus trans you know transfers down through the valley here to Edom to get his people that are that are we think are going to be saved and protected in in uh, Petra so he goes to get his people and uh, Basra is a is the place that kind of is uh, where the where the uh, opening is to get into the city of Petra. So all that's talking about the city of Petra and that area. That's where he's going after the Battle of Armageddon. That's why I say he can get blood on his clothes as right. he's going down through the valley there. So that's who he's talking about. And he says, why is your apparel red? Well, like I said, that's why I think it is red. And, and I've seen a lot of, of scholars, when they picture this, they actually picture his, his whole robe being soaked yeah. re in red. Soft. That's right, it is. <laughs> and so uh, whenever you see that idea about a wine press, that's always concerning the judgment of God. Mm -hmm. So he's trans he treads the wine press. So that's when he goes and gets the people from Petra, and he brings them back. This is his victorious return that we're talking about. He brings them all back to Jerusalem, brings them back to the temple, as we will see. And uh, so we know that, that uh, this also ties in with a prophecy, uh, another prophecy from Isaiah, which was Isaiah 61, uh, verses 1 and 2. And this is when Jesus was first starting his ministry. And he went back to his hometown of Nazareth. Right. And they asked him, as often uh, they would do, uh, they asked him to take the scroll and read a scripture and talk about it yeah. to them. You know, So it just so happens that the scroll was opened by the, the, the caretaker of the, the uh, synagogue to one particular verse, which is very interesting if you follow through it with it. And it's uh, Isaiah 61, verse 1 and 2. Now, this is actually repeated by Jesus 
in Luke. Yeah, and we'll cover that and, here in a and minute. And we're going to cover that, yes. And we'll see what that is. And that, But that's, it all ties in with these two questions about why is your robe red and, yeah. and, and you know, who, why are you coming from Edom? Uh, you know, so we'll just kind of let the story continue here as we go. Yeah, and what we're seeing take place here, Coach, is really a culmination of God's great plan for the ages. Mm-hmm. He, he, there's really... Jesus accomplishes two things here, and he accomplishes these things alone. First of all, he atones for our sin all right. alone. And he alone hung on the cross bearing the weight of our guilt. Mm-hmm. And, and we already know that. Mm-hmm. Second of all, he judges the world alone, which is what we're talking about right, right here. Right. And God does not need us to execute his ultimate judgment. Mm-hmm. He, we leave that all to him. Exactly. That's all him. Right. It's not us. And that takes us to that that passage in Luke that you were just talking about, Coach. And we're going to look at Luke chapter 4, 18 through 21. And it says, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because He has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom from the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. He began by saying to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. And that's where the fight started. (laughs) Yeah, it's to explain what's going on here. Uh, The fact that that scroll was opened and handed to him to this very scripture, God had his hand on that scroll because this was a well-known prophetic verse uh, that had been in the, uh, of course, the Jewish Bible for ages, and it specifically was talking about the Messiah coming. And that's so when Jesus starts to read this, you know, he says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. This is the, these are the exact same words that Isaiah had spoken hundreds of years before and prophesied that this is what the Messiah would do when he came. And it said, it goes on to say, he has, uh, he sent me to proclaim release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, and to set free those who are oppressed. Well, see, he's right at the beginning of his ministry. Right. And he is making this statement or reading this. And lastly, it says, and to proclaim the, the favorable year of the Lord. Now, what it doesn't tell you here is that there is another phrase that ends this scripture that's not read judgment judgment right <laughs> the last part of this because it says that he once he's got to there he he closed the scroll yep. and sat down well he did not read the part that says that this uh today the, he says that uh um this is proclaimed the favorable year of the lord and the day of god's vengeance because, see, he didn't come to uh, for vengeance the first time. Right. He came to to perform his his ministry, uh, which was, we talked about, a ministry of peace. So he left that peace out because it wasn't time yet. But then what he did do that kind of started the ball rolling for him <laughs> was that he told them, today this scripture is fulfilled within your hearing So in other words, he's saying, this is my scripture. I am the Messiah. And this was spoken to the, of course, the Jewish leaders and in the synagogue and everything. And some things like that would, you know, they immediately take offense to Mm -hmm. because he's claiming to be God. And they know that is sacrilege. You know, that's uh, not you. uh, That's one of the death penalties for a Jew that would claim to be God himself. And that's what Jesus openly does here. So uh, this pro- passage prophesied the mission of the Messiah, and he's explaining to them, I, this is my mission. This is why I'm here. So uh, he stopped reading at that one point, and, and what we find out is that, that the people were so angry, they took him out of the, temp, out of the synagogue up to, a, to the top of a hill uh, above Nazareth, and we're going to throw him off. 
Now, we're not sure what exactly happened to change their mind, but the, when we read about it, it just simply says, and Jesus walked through the crowd. Yep. Uh, very miraculously, he was saved. It was not time. It, it was not his time to die yet. So all that kind of, again, is really interesting how this all fits right in with the last days that we're talking about. It, it really is. And when you look at this, it, he, he really stopped there when he was reading this passage in Isaiah. It really probably coached for a couple of reasons. The biggest reason, like you said, his, this was about his earthly ministry. Right. And that's what he was referring to here. And then what came after that was judgment, which that's what we're studying now. Right, that's going to come. And that's going to come in, in right. the book of Revelation. But even past that, if, if you look at human nature, once he said this right here, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing, they wouldn't have heard anything else anyways. No. They've shut down right there. They wanted to kill him. Right. Like you said, and you've actually been to that spot. Yes, I have. I've been to, it's in Israel, it's a place called Mount Precipice. And uh, it is, a, a, uh, I believe they said it's about 150 mi- or 150 foot drop off this cliff onto big boulders on, and below. So obviously it would kill anybody that would do that. So yeah. interesting, interesting how God ties the Old Testament with the book yeah. of Revelation and the end times. Yeah. And that takes us to this, why is your apparel red as we transition in here? And I, I think we've probably answered that, really, if, if you're going to look at it not, not as a rhetorical question. Right, right. We see how, how it could be and where the blood may have come from. And so, the, but again, the, the important thing we want to realize is, is this question was asked hundreds of years before Christ was ever born. So this, again, is showing the prophetic part of God's plan and how Christ filled it to the very exact detail yeah. as, as, as we see uh, going through here. So the idea, uh, as we read that there, we have kind of answered the question. And as I said, this is where he walks and gets his people and he brings them back to Jerusalem. And that's, that's uh, really the next important thing we, we need to talk about. Yeah, like we talked about earlier, at his first coming, Jesus filled the role of the Lamb of God and shed his blood mm-hmm. for our sins. And at his second coming, he's going to fill the role of the Lion right. of the tribe of Judah and devour his enemies, which is what's getting ready to happen right, right. now. But you know, before we jump into that, we actually have another question here that's interesting mm-hmm. when you think about it because he's actually going to enter in to what's called the Holy of Holies for the first time. Right. What do we make of that? Yeah, of course, most people I think knows what we mean by the Holy of Holies of the temple. Right. This was the innermost part or room in the temple itself. And the only person that was allowed to enter that room was the high priest. And the high priest was allowed to enter one time a year. And that was on the Day of Atonement. And uh, the idea here is that that day of atonement was when he went in and prayed forgiveness for the entire nation. Uh, they, uh, you know, they uh, high priest went in. He had to do, go through a, 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 a ritual cleansing of himself. Uh, he had to be very careful that he did everything right by the law. And if he went in there, it was behind a big curtain. Nobody could see what he was, what was going on. And if he went in there and did something wrong, God would kill him. Yep. That's how serious this was. He would lose his life in there. And uh, again, to, you know, uh, talking about when I was in Israel, I asked the guide, I said, I've heard some rumors about this. Can you verify them? He said, you don't even have to ask. Cause he said, I get asked by everybody. And the, because my question was, well, if he goes in and he does something wrong, he dies. How do you get him out of there? You know, <laughs> with a rope. <laughs> yeah, and that's what that's what he said. He said, first of all, he said the bottom of his robe had little bells on it, and it was his job to ring those little bells every once in a while to let everybody know he's all right. <laughs> but he said then too, they they would put a rope on his leg, one of his legs. And if, if they didn't hear that bell ring when it was supposed to, they would start pulling on that rope and pull him out. So I don't know how many times that ever happened, but, yeah. but you know, he said, yes, that was very true. 
So, uh, you know, so when Christ comes in, Christ is now coming in a dual role. He's already shown that he's king because he was able to defeat, of course, the armies of the world. Now he's coming into as high priest. Right. And this is the first time that he has shown that role. The first time he came, you know, of course, he came as the servant, right. suffering servant. Now he's come and he's, he's come as king. He's now going to do the idea of being a priest uh, and the, the uh, fulfill basically the other two roles that he has as our Messiah. And so going into the Holy of Holies, he is just acknowledging that I am the high priest. Uh, of Israel now. You don't need any other priests uh, taking, uh, you know, that spot because he, you know, the priests uh, or the priestly line came down through Aaron, uh, Moses' brother, who was the first high priest there. And everybody that was a high priest from then on had to be a descendant of Aaron. Well, Jesus is not a descendant of Aaron. And the Bible tells us that he is not a priest in the line of Aaron, but he is a priest in the line of a man that we only hear about one time in the Bible, a man named Melchizedek. Yep. And he, you find him back in Genesis who uh, dealing with Abraham. And uh, he is a priest if through, from the line or through the line of Melchizedek. And of course, he's the one, Jesus is right now our high priest in heaven, and when we pray, he, you know, it goes through him as, a, as our high priest because he makes intercession for us from us to God. Yeah. And so now he's, this is what that is signifying. Yeah, so the first time Jesus came, like you said, he came as a servant mm -hmm. and not as a high priest. Right. Therefore, he, and he was also a man. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it wouldn't have really worked if he had gone in within the Holy of Holies. He'd have died. <laughs> well, <laughs> according to the, right. the laws. Right. But, you know, now on, on Jesus' death, the first Holy of Holies, or God's throne in heaven, became accessible to every single believer. This is what I really like. This yeah. is really cool. Yeah. Christians may approach God confidently, not on their own merit, mm -hmm. but through the righteousness credited to them by the shed blood of Christ. And Jesus atoned once and for all, all of humanity's sins. And when he died on the cross, and at the same time became our high priest. And that, that's why he could go and actually enter into the Holy of Holies mm -hmm. at that, this, what, this event we're talking about. But here's the really neat part about mm -hmm. this, Coach. No longer does God confine himself to the Holy of Holies, mm -hmm. separated from his people. When Christ ascended into heaven, every Christian became a temple of the Holy Spirit. Right. That is cool. A living dwelling place of God. And, and two, we no longer, as the Jewish people had to do, we don't have to have a, a priest down here, an earthly priest, to make amends for our sins. Yep. Christ did it once and for all, and he is our high priest. And the, again, tying in with one of the neat things you're talking about, if you will remember when Christ was crucified, the moment that he died on the cross, yep. the temple curtain was torn, at, with, which is the, the curtain that separated the, war, the people from the Holy of Holies. And that temple or, or that curtain wasn't just a little, little curtain. So, you know, I, I've read about the curtain, and it, you, it says it's somewhere between five to 10 inches thick. Uh -huh. Now you can imagine trying to tear something that's that thick. Well, the other interesting thing is it says it was torn from top to bottom, meaning the one that did the tearing was God himself because yep. no man could do it. Yep. So, and that simply says the temple is now open and, and uh, we can go directly to the throne of God. We don't need to go to, through some priest. That event all in itself, Coach, was an intentional Event. It wasn't Certainly. an accidental no. event. It wasn't accidental that the, the curtain was torn or torn in the manner that you mm -hmm. talked about. It was divine. Right. And it had a purpose. Certainly. It, it, that was so that people realized that the Holy of Holies that they had there was not necessary any longer. Mm -hmm. And now, Coach, we're, we're going to start in, into the what we're looking at, the Jewish feast here, and how it relates 
to the end times. And you, you see God's seven annual feasts are relevant to both Jew and Gentiles today, right. still today. And they show prophetically God's complete plan concerning the coming of the Messiah, uh, the redemption of mankind, judgment, and the, the establishment of the kingdom of God on earth. And if you recall, which I know you would, but if you were, those of you who are listening, the number seven is significant because it is the number of completion. Right. So the seven Jewish feasts, once that seventh Jewish feast is completed or finished, something just completed itself. Right. And we're going to talk about that. Right. Yeah. And, and I, I would like to make, before we actually get into that, uh, to finish my story about him bringing his people back to Jerusalem. He will bring his the group of people that he went after it in Petra into Jerusalem, and he's going to bring them, as the Bible says, through what is known as the Eastern Gate of Jerusalem, also called the Golden Gate. And the interesting thing about the Golden Gate is, as of right now, it is sealed. There is no gate, except you can see where it's been blocked up, and that was done in, in the year 1517, by one of the Ottoman leaders, Suleiman, he blocked that up. And he did it because of the prophecy in the Bible right. that Christ was going to come through that gate. And he decided he was going to stop Christ. And not only that did he do block up the gate, but the Muslims have put a cemetery in front of that gate, a Muslim cemetery with many graves, because again, Jews have their priests, of which Christ was now a priest we talked about. A Jewish priest will not enter a cemetery. It, it gives him defile, he is defiled if he does that. So here, the, here are even the Muslims, the early Muslims, trying to keep God, Jesus from coming into the Holy of Holies that we just talked about. And, and uh, that's, that's a, a, an interesting, interesting story when you think about it. Yeah, it really is. And as we begin to talk about these feasts too, Coach, God's feasts are a timeline for mm -hmm. mankind. And, you know, we, we see mm -hmm. the spring feast here, and those have already happened. Right. And if you'd like to just kind of go over those, that'd be wonderful. Okay. Yeah, the, the first four, which we call the spring feast, see, these are all related to harvest, right. basically. You know, and there are a lot of them are. And the four in, that are in the spring... Uh, come in a certain in the order that we see them here in, on the slide. But Jesus actually fulfilled these four spring feasts at his first coming. Right. For example, he was crucified on Passover. That was the day he was crucified. He was buried on the, un, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. That's the second feast. He was resurrected on the Feast of First Fruits. And the fourth one... The Holy Spirit, he sent the Holy Spirit on Pentecost. So there's your first four feasts, and he fulfilled every one of them to the day yep. that it was celebrated in his first advent, okay? Because you remember when he came to Jerusalem and they to, uh, to trial, it was all, they were coming to celebrate Passover. Excuse me, Passover. So that's where it all started, and it just fell in all four of those feasts. Uh, and so what, what that does, excuse me, does for us now, if he fulfilled the first four in the spring feast on his first coming, guess what's going to happen on his second coming? <laughs> He's going to fulfill the last three at his second coming. Uh, the last three that we talk about, he's going to come back on the Feast of Trumpets. Because remember the the trumpets, how the trumpets involved with the coming on the rapture and 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 everything. And these were the fall feasts. These that we're are the three about. fall feasts, right? That the feast of trumpets is also known as Rosh Hashanah, yep. is the Jew, Jewish feast name. And then there are ten days between Rosh Hashanah and the Day of Atonement, right. which is called Yom Kippur. So that's the you know that's the next one that's going that's going to happen is Yom Kippur, and that's the atonement, uh, you know, when Jesus is going to declare the Jewish people cleared of their sin. That remnant is going to come, and Jesus is going to pronounce that they are holy 
because they, that remnant is the ones that turned to him when they were running away from the battle. You know, so they are have accepted him. They are now, uh, you know, holy and sanctified because they have accepted him. So that's that's the day of atonement that we would be talking about before that. And then lastly, uh, well, that's called as I said called Yom Kippur. And then the next thing that happens is the millennium. That's going to be started on the day of the Feast of Tabernacles. Right. Perfect. Which we are also going to celebrate uh, at, in the millennium the Feast of Tabernacles. So again, it's just amazing that he fulfilled and will fulfill the, all seven of those major feasts by the time he comes back the second time. That is really neat to watch how this all plays out. And that really takes us, Coach, to, to that last question, and you've kind of answered that a little bit, but how do the Jewish fall feasts relate to the end time events? Like you said, the first four feasts were the spring feasts, right. and they were more related to agriculture. Mm -hmm. uh, now we see the three fall feasts coming into play. Right, and these three are more related to the individual things of salvation, uh, of, of uh, uh, you know, asking forgiveness for sins, the sacrifice that Jesus made. And they, as I said, will be fulfilled, I feel very confidently on exactly the day that that feast is supposed to occur whenever Christ comes back. Yeah. So it's all going to fit right in with, uh, you know, God's got it all planned out exactly what's going to happen. So it, it's a, you know, again, it just kind of boggles your mind to think how God would have all this planned so perfectly. And again, the fact that Jesus fulfilled the first four in his first advent gives you all the confidence in the oh, yeah. world to know that it's going to continue and God's plan is going to finish it out. Yeah, that, the, these these three fall feasts that we're talking about here that are yet to come are a shadow of things mm -hmm. to come. And think about that for a minute. You know, you think about what is a shadow. If you're walking down the street on a sunny day, you might see your shadow before somebody sees you. Mm -hmm. that, that's kind of the idea here. Yeah. The feasts of the Lord are a foreshadowing of things that will happen. Passover was a shadow. Mm -hmm. When Jesus came, he redeemed us all from our sins and became the eternal Lamb of God and the full atonement once and for all. Pentecost was also a shadow. You talked about that mm -hmm. just a minute ago. So until the Holy Spirit came, really in a, in a great powerful way that he did on the day of Pentecost, the anointing lasted only for one year. Mm -hmm. Now the Holy Spirit is in us forever. Right. Right. <laughs> it's just amazing how this all comes together. Yeah. So these things, these fall feasts are just a, a shadow of prophetic events that are getting ready to happen. All right. And that really takes us back to that end uh, timeline again. Right. Looking at it. And we're marching through it here uh, now. Yeah, we're, we're right there ready to fall off the end of it here pretty soon. <laughs> but, yeah, yeah that's the, the timeline now. We have gone through, uh, you know, the, uh, through the tribulation we're now into the point where we, you see the words, the millennial reign of Christ. And that's the next step. That's the next thing that's going to happen. And I said that will occur on the Feast of Tabernacles and whenever after these other things have happened. And that will lead us for, into a thousand year period of time, which we will talk about that um, uh, uh, where Christ is literally going to be, God is going to dwell with us here on earth. And there's going to be a great renovation of the earth, but the the temple will be back. Will still be in Jerusalem. Everybody will come and and worship at that temple. Uh, it will be the center of the earth, in particular, right. for everybody and every day and every every day. That's correct. So we are at that point, right? Getting ready for the thousand year millennial reign of Christ, and we'll talk more about it on our on our next. Uh, next segment. But, uh, you know, th this idea is that we're right here toward the, you know, toward the end of the timeline. And whenever, you th whenever we look at that, we're just getting closer and closer to when the rapture is going to occur. And even if you don't think it, you, you don't think it's going to happen for a long time. It's still closer than it was when we started this study. <laughs> yeah. You know, so, and, and you, we need, need to be ready. 
uh, when that rapture occurs. So our timeline here is, is again, the same one we've been looking at since the first time we set, uh, set this up. And uh, we see here that Christ is still on, uh, or when he comes back, he's gonna be reigning from Jerusalem, as I said, and, and he will be, we'll be able to walk right up and talk to him. We'll be able to talk to see God and talk to God. Uh, and uh, God's gonna make a special city for us. We're gonna find, and it's just you know gonna be a wonderful thing as long as you are ready. Yeah. Many, many people confuse this event that we're talking about today, Coach, Christ's second coming, mm -hmm. Christ's you know, victorious return. Some people confuse that with the rapture, mm -hmm. and that, that just really is not the case because yeah. Christ does not come all the way to earth mm -hmm. when the church is actually raptured out of the world. Right. So just bear that in mind, folks. I'm I, not sure what answer it was they were looking for, mm -hmm. but uh, Christ does come to earth and right at this millennial reign, which we're talking about now. Right. And that takes us, Coach, that thought to remember, and it says, if God fulfilled his spring feast, you can rest assured the fall feasts are coming. And could you take that thought to remember? Give us some final thoughts as we wrap it up here today. Sure. Uh, as I'm sure most of you know by now, you know, I am a, I am a math teacher by profession and I have been for 50 years. And uh, when people ask or talk about this with me, uh, the, the, the people that give me uh, grief about it is are mostly people that are really uh, hot into science. Yeah. And, and they say, this can't happen. You know, this is scientifically impossible. Uh, what you're saying is going to happen. You can't bring somebody back to life. You can't, uh, uh, you know, this earth is not going to change these ways and so forth. And I tell them, you know, you're looking at it from the wrong view. I said, you're looking at it from the scientific view. I said, I look at it from the mathematical view and probability. I said, I've looked through the book of Revelation and God has been 100% correct on all of his prophecies. And I said, then I can rest assured that he's gonna be 100% correct on all the ones that are yet to come. I'll stick with the mathematical view myself rather than, <laughs> than the scientific view. Well, as we look at this here too, Coach, <clears throat> you don't have to go through all this. It, yeah. you, if you accept Jesus Christ as your, as your Lord and Savior, uh, this is all just something to talk about. It's not something you experience. And, you know, we started this whole segment off with, have you ever wondered when Christ will return to earth? And, or have you ever wondered how Christ will return to earth? Well, we actually do know the answer to those questions. Yeah. Uh, once the rapture occurs, you can almost get it down to the day. Right. Uh, that it, it really is. Now, what people don't know, what nobody knows, is when the rapture is going to occur. Right. So the key is <clears throat> is to not go through the tribulation period. And the only way to do that is to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And as we've told him, before the rapture. Yeah, that before the rapture. <laughs> And if you have any questions about that or how to do that, we would love to walk you through that. This is Pine Grove Baptist Church in Parkersburg, West Virginia, and you should see the contact information on the screen. For those of you who watch week to week, maybe this is your very first time, we would encourage you to share this message with your contacts out on whatever social media platform it is that you subscribe to. It just gets the word out, and we're also out on different podcast platforms as well. We thank each one of you for making us part of your week. We don't take it, uh, I mean, we take it as a, a very high privilege, Coach, to be able to do this every week, uh, and we're just very appreciative of that. Next week, the title of our study is The Millennial Reign of Christ, and, and everything we did this week really sets that up right. and it ushers it in. And we're excited about that. I can't wait to get to, to next week. So until next time, this is Mike Cornell along with Coach Ron Lathy and our production manager, Andy Holbrook, wishing everybody have a blessed week, and we hope to see you real soon.